A very good evening to everybody here and a warm welcome from the partners for this inaugural John Stott London Lecture. So from the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity, from All Souls Langham Place, from the Langham Partnerships and from Arosha. And um, it's a very special occasion for us, not just because it's the first, but this is something that we know as a project was very uh, close to John Stott's heart. Those who knew what he talked about and thought about a lot will know that he often spoke about double listening, that the Christian faith made sense in the context of close attention to contemporary conditions. And we are living in absolutely exceptional times environmentally. And candidly, one has to say, uh, the church has not always, the Christian community has not always done a very good job of listening attentively to those conditions. And also, John was persuaded that there needed to be a close professional engagement, a careful dialogue, conversation, between those who really knew what they were talking about in the different disciplines. And he was, I can tell you, from many personal encounters, completely ruthless when he felt you didn't know what you were talking about. <laughs> um, so, so we're very, very privileged, actually, to have uh, Chris Wright and David Nussbaum to speak to us tonight. And I confess, as we were thinking about this, that there was a certain unease on my part because your instinct is, who is the person who would bring the theological firepower and the latest high-end conservation thinking and experience and would have a global life and who could address us? And of course, the truth is, and it's not just because of the level of specialization that's constantly taking place, that's not how the Christian community should function anyway in finding heroes who do it all. But it's also that this is an ongoing conversation. We're in very early days with this. And so actually, I think it's extremely appropriate that we've been able to snag from their global lives and many commitments to people who can bring those two things together. I happen to know that uh, Chris is a passionate birder. He's been um, involved with Arosha all over the world and proselytized by our teams wherever he goes. And then I think John Stott snagged him as well. So uh, he's environmentally keenly aware. And I happen to know also that David is no theological slouch. I think you've got two theological degrees tucked away there quietly. So this isn't as it seems. <laughs> Look to WWF for the theology and Chris for the good birding. But it's a great privilege to have you both here. You both have had uh, a great deal of experience around the world. You're not going to give us easy answers. And I know that we are going to be listening very attentively. And we hope tonight, actually, you'll start a bushfire because if the Christian church around the world does not understand that this is vitally important, it's not just us that's in trouble, it's everybody. But if the Christian church does, given that they are mostly present where biodiversity is concentrated, then we're at an extraordinary moment of hope. So we're, we're very much listening forward to hearing you both. Thanks so much for coming. Well, good evening, and thank you so much, Peter, for your welcome. Uh, it's a great joy for me to be part of, of this inaugural shared lecture together for the first John Stott London Lecture, uh, and a particular pleasure that it is indeed a partnership that I think John Stott himself would have welcomed uh, between three organizations that he either founded or deeply loved, uh, with Langham and the London Institute and Arosha, along with the church, which, of course, is forever associated with his name, All Souls Church. Uh, and it's a joy to me to share with David uh, in, this, in this project and to be with you this evening. Uh, my task is to think about the theological and biblical dimensions of creation care. Uh, and I would love you to come and take a look with me at, at three great affirmations that the Bible makes as a foundation and motivation for our earth keeping. Uh, and by the way, you had in the sheaf of papers that you got on the way in uh, the outline of this lecture, so you may wish to fish that out from wherever it disappeared to under your seat 
uh, because that may help as, as we go along. Uh, you'll see that it's entitled The Goodness, The Glory, and The Goal of Creation. The goodness of creation in the sense of looking back to its original creation by God. The glory of creation as we look around at the ongoing, continuing, present role of creation in bringing praise and glory to its creator. And the goal of creation as we look forward to God's purpose for the whole creation in and through Jesus Christ. Now, for reasons of time, I've decided to concentrate mainly on the second and third and to summarize the first, partly because I think many of us, at least those of us here who are Christians, will be fairly familiar with the first theme, that is that creation is good, that it is good in relation to God, who created it and declared it to be good, and reveals his character as good and righteous and just and kind, all those dimensions of his character related to creation in the Bible, that it is intrinsically valuable to him because he declared it to be good before we were ever around to see it. So goodness is something intrinsic to creation, and it was created by him as a dwelling place, the creation as a kind of cosmic temple, and the temple in Jerusalem as a kind of microcosm, uh, a, a, a small uh, cosmic reality on earth. Those are theological themes that I'm not going to go into this evening. The other side of that equation, the goodness of creation related to its goodness not only to God, but also in, re in relation to us as human beings, uh, because we are created by God in his image in order to rule and to care for the earth. Uh, so those affirmations that are made in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, uh, which seem to me so brilliantly and beautifully balanced, that the kind of kingship or rule or dominion that we are to exercise is to be modeled on God's own kingship, which is a kingship which is loving and just and providing and caring for his creation, and that it is to be exercised through serving creation in the same way that priests were located in the temple to serve the dwelling place of God. So there's a great deal in there, uh, in that first section, the goodness of creation, looking back to all that we can draw from the biblical materials, uh, not just from Genesis, but from elsewhere in the Bible, including in the New Testament. So I'm going to, in a sense, pass over that simply because uh, there's a, a, a considerable time constraint since there are two lectures this evening and we need to be fair to each other. But I have tried to say more about those issues uh, in some of the books that I've written on the mission of God and the mission of God's people. So you, you can follow it up later. And if you want the text of this lecture, you can uh, email me or perhaps through uh, one of our websites. And I'm very happy to send you the full text if you want it uh, at some later stage. But let's move on, secondly then, to the glory of creation. And I want to address that in two ways, as you can see on the outline. First of all, God's glory expressed through the praise of creation. When I was a little boy, I grew up in the Presbyterian Church, and we used to have to learn the shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession of Faith, even as children. And the first question in that is, what is the chief end of man? And you can imagine the fun that little boys had with the idea of man's chief end uh, and <laughs> where it was positioned. But the answer to that question, what is the chief purpose of human existence, which of course is what the question means, is that the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's the purpose of human existence is what we were learning. And I believe that the same question and the same answer could be applied to creation as a whole. Creation exists for the, for the praise and glory of God for God's enjoyment of his creation and for its enjoyment of him. So the ultimate purpose of human life, to glorify God and praise him, is not something that distinguishes us from the rest of creation, but rather something that we share in common with all the rest of creation. Now, of course, we must immediately agree that we as human beings glorify God in uniquely human ways with our rationality, language, emotion, poetry, music, art, and so on, hearts and hands and minds and voices in our choice of psalmody, as the hymn says, we know what it means for us as human beings to praise and glorify God. But the Bible affirms that all creation already praises God and can be summoned repeatedly to do so in many of the psalms, not just the animals and everything that has breath, but also mountains, hills, trees, all of creation is there to praise God. 
So at the very end of the Bible, in John's climactic vision in the book of Revelation, he sees the whole universe centered around the throne of God, reaching its climactic crescendo of praise when he says, quote, Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them bringing worship, praising him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Now, we may not be able to grasp how creation praises God or how God receives the praise of his non-human creatures. I have a feeling, no more than that, that creatures praise and glorify God simply by being and do what they were created to be and do. Simply by their existence, they glorify God because they exist by his sustaining power and renewal. But simply because we cannot understand how creation praises and glorifies God, we should not therefore deny what the Bible so often affirms, namely that it does. So God's glory in the praise of creation, but secondly, God's glory seen in the fullness of creation. The glory of God is sometimes linked in biblical texts with the fullness of the earth, or literally in Hebrew, the filling of the earth. The rich abundance of biodiversity itself is celebrated in Genesis 1, of course, as creation narrative moves from that which was tohu avohu, which might be translated functionless and empty. And it moves from that position to that which is ordered and full, richly full of all that is there in creation. There are examples in the Psalms. For example, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and its fullness. Psalm 50, the world is mine and all that fills it after a list of the animals of the forest, the cattle, the birds, and the insects. Or Psalm 104, verse 31, a precise parallel. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in all his works, the works of the Lord in creation being set alongside the glory of God. That gives, I think, an interesting perspective on the cry of the seraphim during Isaiah's vision of God in the temple in Isaiah 6. And I owe this thought to Hilary Marlowe, who's here this evening, and always like to attribute it to her because she shared it with me some good number of years ago. What they cry out, you remember, as Isaiah was in the temple and was, in a sense, being overwhelmed by the glory of God, is that they cry out, holy, holy, holy is Yahweh, the Lord of hosts, the filling of all the earth, his glory. And that is usually translated, the whole earth is full of his glory. It's the standard English translation, which of course is true. But reading the sentence in English like that can marginalize the word full, as if the earth is simply a receptacle with glory filling it. But the word fullness stands emphatically first in the Hebrew sentence as a noun. And the fullness of the earth, as we can see in several of the Psalms, is a shorthand expression for the abundance of life on earth in all its wonderful forms and complexity. Accordingly, it would be possible to translate that sentence as the abundance of life that fills the earth constitutes the glory of God. That is to say, the glory of God can be seen in the abundance of God's own creation. Now, of course, at that point, we would immediately need to be careful not to read pantheism into such a statement, as if there were nothing more to God and his glory than the sum of all of creation. God's glory transcends creation. The Psalms say, you have set your glory above the heavens. But having said that, I think we can certainly affirm that the glory of God is mediated to us through creation itself not just in the majestic glory of the heavens, Psalm 19, but also the abundance of life on earth. We live, in short, in a glory-filled earth, which is one reason why the Apostle Paul could say that human beings are without excuse when we fail to glorify God and to give thanks to him. There's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 31, that says, "'Whoever oppresses the poor person shows contempt for their maker.'" but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. The principle is that since human beings are made in God's image, whatever we do to other people, we are in some sense also doing to God, positively or negatively, principle that Jesus made very clear in Matthew 25. I would argue that it is a legitimate extension of that same principle to conclude that since the fullness of created life on earth in some sense constitutes God's glory, or at least is one of the ways in which we experience God's glory, then we can say that whatever fulfills Genesis 1 and 2 by developing, enhancing, properly using and caring for the earth acknowledges and contributes to the glory of God. 
And conversely, whatever needlessly destroys, degrades, pollutes, and wastes life on earth diminishes the glory of God. How we treat the earth reflects how we treat its creator and ours. Let me move on then to the third main point, uh, where I will spend uh, most of the remaining time, the goal of creation. And at this point, we're no longer just looking back to the original creation and our role within it, and all that we could derive from the Genesis text and so on, nor are we simply looking around at the glory of God expressed in the praise of creation and the fullness of life on earth. We're now looking forward to God's ultimate purpose for creation, and I find it a very encouraging direction to look. First of all, I would want to say that creation is included in the scope of God's redemptive purpose. The first thing we need to say is that creation needs redemption. From the very beginning of the Bible, as early as the third chapter of Genesis, it is made clear to us that human sin and evil, including satanic evil of some kind, have affected the natural order as well as human and spiritual life. Cursed is the earth because of you, said God to Adam. Now, I think that the primary focus of that statement is on the earth, which in Hebrew there is Adama, not Eretz, the earth as soil, as the ground, the place where we live, uh, in its relationship to human work and life, because that is the context in which God says it, rather than being, in a sense, an ontological statement about the geological structures and functioning of the planet itself. In other words, I do not personally believe, and I know there are those who do, and it's, a, it's an open question, I do not personally believe that we should attribute all natural phenomena that are potentially destructive, such as the shifting of tectonic plates, earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic eruptions, and so on, to God's curse on the earth. Uh, as Tom Wright once said, a tectonic plate's got to do what a tectonic plate's got to do. Uh, it's, it's simply the way things are. Nevertheless, we do need to see that Paul does make the clear theological affirmation that the whole of creation is in some sense frustrated, subject to futility, including decay and bondage, and will remain so until it is liberated by God and, quote, brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God in Romans 8. Paul speaks about the redemption of creation. The truth then, it seems to me, from the Bible is that just as creation shares in the effects of our sin, so we will share in the fullness of creation's redemption. For God's ultimate purpose, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 1 verse 10, is, quote, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. One of the most astonishingly universal cosmic affirmations in the Bible. Or to put it more bluntly, we are not going to be saved out of the earth, but saved along with the earth in biblical thinking. Well, where did Paul get such an idea from? Clearly from his, the scriptures, the scriptures that we now call the Old Testament. For the prophets of the Old Testament certainly included ecology in their eschatology. Uh, one can think, for example, of uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 to 9. I'll not read all these texts, but there it speaks about the messianic era when the king will come, the son of David, and it speaks of environmental harmony and the, the ending of uh, devouring and of one another. In Isaiah 65, verses 17 to 25, we have God's explicit affirmation. God says, Behold, I am creating a new heavens and a new earth. It's a participle. It is something that God is in the business of doing. It's not just something, as it were, at the very end of time. And the picture that then follows in Isaiah 65 depicts life on earth filled with joy, free from tears, life fulfilling with a deep satisfaction in the fruitfulness of ordinary human labor, free from the curses of frustration and injustice, and with environmental peace and harmony. It's a glorious picture which provided much of the imagery and vocabulary that we find picked up in Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And of course, there's Psalm 96, the closing verses of that psalm, in which the whole of creation, the trees, the forest, the whole of creation is called upon to rejoice. Why? Because God is coming to put things right. Now, we might be tempted to think, well, ah, this is all just Old Testament because they couldn't see beyond the earth. Uh, and so they were looking forward to an earthly material future. And we, of course, knowing better from the New Testament, believe in a spiritual future. Well, that's not the way the Bible puts it. 
Paul speaks very clearly of a new redeemed creation being brought to birth within the womb of this creation. He speaks of the groaning of this creation as the labor pains of creation's own future as well as ours in Romans 8. That we will inhabit that new creation in our redeemed bodies modeled on the resurrection body of Jesus. That's the language of Paul in Romans 8 and Philippians 3 and of John in 1 John chapter 3 verse 2. This is a, a very important reason why the bodily resurrection of Jesus is such a vital Christian doctrine. The disciples thought when they saw the risen Jesus, they thought he was a ghost, says Luke. But he deliberately demonstrated to his disciples that he was not, that he was fully and even more physically real with body parts. He said, look at my hands and my feet, with flesh and bones, as he said, and with the ability to eat and digest food. The resurrection of Jesus is God's yes to creation. The risen Jesus is the first fruits of the new creation. But that's the first point. But we need to move on, secondly, to a, a concern that some people have struggling with this whole idea of the redemption of creation because they believe that the future of the universe is utter and total obliteration in a cosmic conflagration. And that's what I call my second point, purging, not obliteration. That sometimes is due because people have linked uh, their thinking to an unbiblical dualism in which they think of matter itself, the material stuff of what we are made, bodies and things like that, as inferior and tainted and temporary, whereas only the spiritual realm is pure and eternal. And so they envisage a future in terms of ultimate release from the shackles of physicality here on earth into the enjoyment of a more spiritual heaven with God. However, even those who are not infected by that kind of simplistic dualism, which I think is unbiblical, still want to take seriously the language of destruction that we find in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12, where Peter, speaking about the day of the Lord, pictures it in the language of destruction and conflagration by fire. And they say, surely that's where we're headed, to ultimate destruction of the creation, not some sense of redemption and renewal. However, I would say that we need to see the context and the argument of that whole chapter in 2 Peter 3. Peter is arguing against those who were scoffing at the idea of a future coming judgment, complacently believing that everything will go on just as it always has done forever and ever. That's what they were saying. And what they forget, says Peter, is that such an attitude was around before the flood, but God did intervene and did act in judgment. And so God will assuredly and finally do in the future, says Peter, what he prefigured in the past. What he did then by water, he will in the end do by fire, that is, bring judgment and purging. Now, the key thing to observe here, I think, is that the language of destruction of the world, quotes, is used in both parts of the chapter about both events. I'm quoting now verses 6 and 7. By those waters, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word of God, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction, same word, of the ungodly. Now, what was destroyed in the flood? Not the planet. Not the whole of creation, but the ungodly human society on earth at that time, or the destruction of the ungodly, as Peter explicitly says. The apocalyptic language of fire in the second half of the chapter then, seems to me, should be understood in that biblical sense of purging, cleansing fire of judgment, that the universe will be purged of all that is evil, and, quotes, the earth and everything in it will be laid bare, as Peter said, to the all-seeing eyes of our creator and judge. And after that fiery cleansing, after the destruction of what we might call the world as we know it, the world in rebellion against God, then, says Peter, in keeping with God's promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So that's what I mean by purging, not obliteration. But moving on, how will this be accomplished? Well, in fact, it already has been. We not, may not be able to imagine with our finite brains what the new creation will be like or how God will do it. The question that I'm often asked about the new creation when I talk this, well, what's it going to be like? Resurrection bodies, new heavens, new earth? And I really don't know. But Paul assures us that it is guaranteed and, in a sense, already accomplished through the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
the third point on your sheet, that creation ultimately will be, has been reconciled to God through the cross of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 23, must be one of the most breathtaking passages that the Apostle Paul ever wrote about Christ. And he says this, that the Son of God is the invisible image of God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then he goes on to talk about the church for a while. Then he comes back to creation in verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through Christ to reconcile to himself all things, whether things in earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Paul says that the whole of creation, which is what all things means in that context, five times he says it, that the whole creation was created by Christ and for Christ, is sustained in existence by Christ, and has been reconciled to God by Christ specifically through his blood shed on the cross. And I think that last phrase is vitally important for those of us who are Christians, that we need to lift up our eyes and see the truly cosmic scope of Christ's death. Paul says that through the cross, God has accomplished the reconciliation of creation. And then he goes on to say in verse 21, and you also get to be part of this. We tend to start the other way around. We start at the personal level. Christ died to atone for our sins and to grant us eternal life. Wonderfully true. Then we might go on to the ecclesial level, that all of us who have this eternal life in Christ are part of the church, the people of God, the body of Christ. And just possibly, we might go on to the rest of creation. Well, we've got to live here on earth until Christ returns to take us home in some sense. Paul moves in precisely the opposite direction. He starts with Christ's cosmic creational lordship over all creation, which incidentally is also where Jesus started in the Great Commission. All authority in heaven and earth is given to me, he says. Then he moves from his cosmic creational lordship to speak about the church, of which he's the head. Then he returns to the redemption of all creation through the cross and finally comes to individual believers who have heard the gospel and responded in faith. You also, he says to the Christians in Colossae. And then he says, this is the gospel. Colossians 1.23. It's the biblical good news that includes creation within the redeeming, saving, reconciling plan of God accomplished through the cross and resurrection of Christ. Which leads to the fourth issue. Is this truly then a gospel issue? It helps us, I think, to understand a phrase that is used in the Cape Town Commitment. I don't know if you're familiar with this little document, uh, the Cape Town Commitment, but you're going to get a copy of it tonight, not in this little blue book, but actually in uh, one of the free books which is available, uh, which will be mentioned at the end, this one, Evangelical Truth by John Stott, with a, a new publication with the Cape Town Commitment within it. It's a document produced by the Lausanne uh, movement, and in the Cape Town Commitment, speaking on this issue, it speaks of creation care as a gospel issue, quotes. And there are some who have said that while they agree that it is certainly an important issue, that it is a biblically grounded responsibility, that it's even a legitimate part of Christian mission, they would not agree that it is, quote, a gospel issue. So let me first of all quote the full context of that phrase because I think it's theologically important for us. So I'm now quoting from the Cape Town commitment at this point. It says this, The earth is created, sustained, and redeemed by Christ. We cannot claim to love God while abusing what belongs to Christ by right of creation, redemption, and inheritance. We, and it means we as Christians, we care for the earth and responsibly use its abundant resources, not according to the rationale of the secular world, but for the Lord's sake. If Jesus is Lord of all the earth, we cannot separate our relationship to Christ from how we act in relation to the earth. For to proclaim the gospel that says Jesus is Lord is to proclaim the gospel that includes the earth, since Christ's lordship is over all creation. Creation care is thus a gospel issue within the lordship of Christ. Now the whole context of that passage, we need to see that the word gospel issue then comes having defined the gospel in relation to Jesus Christ as Lord of all creation, not just in relation to us as human beings and our need for salvation. There's another whole section within the Cape Town Commitment which expounds the biblical understanding of the gospel, not just as a personal salvation plan, but in all its biblical richness of the good news of all that God has done 
in and through the Lord Jesus Christ, and then the imperative that that addresses to us for our response. It speaks of the whole story that the gospel tells in the Bible. It speaks of the assurance that the gospel brings and the transformation that the gospel produces. So it's a much bigger thing than simply me and my salvation. Uh, and there's a whole paragraph, I'll not take time to read it now, it's, you'll be able to pick it up in the Cape Town Commitment, which speaks about those things in declaring how we love the gospel of God as the good news of what God has done. Now then, coming back to this, is creation care a gospel issue? Well, first of all, if you reduce the gospel to mean only a mechanism by which you can ensure your own personal salvation, then you will necessarily consider that gospel issues must only be applied to matters that affect how you get saved or whether you get saved. But the biblical gospel is not just a means of personal salvation. The gospel is the grand biblical story of God's good purpose for all creation in which, by his grace, we can have a share. Gospel issues are broader than individual salvation, but of course include it. Furthermore, secondly, if you reduce the gospel to something that has to do only with what you think in your head and assent to by faith, in other words, primarily a cognitive matter, then you will consider gospel issues, quotes, to be only those things that have to do with faith, or the lack of it, or anything that might threaten the essential message of salvation by grace through faith. But we need to remember that Paul speaks of the obedience of faith and of obeying the gospel in several places in, in Romans and Corinthians. That is, the gospel is something that we respond to not just by believing it, but by acting upon it and living in the light of it. And so we must live now in the light of the whole biblical story, the whole gospel, as the story that begins with creation and ends with a new creation and summons us to live in the first in preparation for the second. That is gospel living, and it includes creation within its scope. And thirdly, if you see the gospel as primarily to do with me and my needs, or other people and their needs, then you will see gospel issues as only those things that either contribute to or militate against the solution to our greatest human need, namely our sin and rebellion against God, and our consequent need for forgiveness. A very serious issue indeed, of course. There are real gospel issues at stake when we are dealing with people's eternal destinies. However, while such concern is entirely valid, it can easily overlook the fact that the New Testament, including the Lord Jesus himself, regularly present the gospel as the good news, not about us and our destiny, although of course including that, but the good news about the reign of God, the kingdom of God. In a world that calls Caesar Lord, the gospel declares there is another king, King Jesus. Jesus is Lord. The gospel proclaims the lordship of Christ and the fact that he exercised that lordship through self-emptying incarnation, his earthly life, atoning death, victorious resurrection, and glorious ascension and ultimate return, and calls us to respond in repentance and faith to that proclamation. From that point of view, gospel issues take on a wider level of meaning and scope. The essence of our responding to the gospel is we choose to submit to Jesus of Nazareth as Lord. The gospel calls me to recognize him as Lord, not just of my personal discipleship, but of the whole environment in which I live. For all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me, said Jesus. If the gospel declares Jesus to be truly Lord of all creation, then how I live out my discipleship to Jesus must also include creation. In that sense, it is a gospel issue within the Lordship of Christ. Or to put it at its most blunt, for someone to claim to be a Christian, to be a follower and disciple of Jesus, to be submitting to Jesus as Lord, and yet to have no concern about the creation, or even to reject with hostility those who do act on such a concern, seems to me to be a denial of the biblical gospel, which proclaims that Jesus Christ is the creator, sustainer, and redeemer of creation itself. I cannot claim Christ as my Lord and Savior, while at the same time denying what the biblical gospel proclaims, that he is creation's Lord and Savior. So on then to my final point. What then is our final destination? It is amazing to me, and indeed very regrettable, how many Christians seem to believe that the world ends with us all leaving the earth behind and going off to heaven to live there instead. 
And it may well be that that's due to the influence of many hymns, of course, which use exactly that kind of imagery, that Christ will return to take us all home to our eternal home up there in some sense. But it is decidedly not how the Bible ends. There is, of course, a very important truth that gives great comfort and hope to which all of us will cling in saying that when believers die in faith and in Christ, they go to be with Christ, safe and secure, at rest, free from the perils and suffering of this earthly life. But the Bible makes it clear that that intermediate state between personal death and the return of Christ is precisely that, intermediate. It is not our final destination to stay in heaven in that sense. The Bible's final great dynamic movement in Revelation 21 and 22 is not of us all going off up to heaven, but of God coming here, bringing the city of God, establishing the reunification of heaven and earth as his dwelling place with us forever. In those opening verses of Revelation 21, three times the loud voice from the throne of God says that God was dwelling with mankind, God with them, with them, three times. And we should remember that the word Emmanuel, of course, one of the titles of Jesus, does not mean us with God, but God with us. We don't go somewhere else to be with God. God comes to earth to be with us, as the psalmists and the prophets had prophesied and prayed for, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. And in that new creation, with God dwelling at last in the cleansed temple of his whole creation, so that no microcosmic temple will be needed, as John saw, or rather didn't see, because he says, I did not see a temple. There was no need for one, because the whole creation had become the temple of God, the dwelling place of God. Then the tribute of the nations will be brought into the city of God, the glory of kings purged and purified and contributing to the glory of God. So, my conclusion. What then does all this mean for our ecological thinking and action in the here and now? It means, it seems to me, that in the godly use of and care for the creation, we are doing two things at the same time. On the one hand, we are exercising the creational role that God gave us from the beginning. And in so doing, we can properly be glorifying God in all our work within creation and for creation. And on the other hand, that we are anticipating the role that we shall have in the new creation when we shall then assume fully our proper role of kings and priests, that is, exercising the loving rule of God over the rest of his creation and serving it on God's behalf in the place of God's temple and dwelling. And that, I think, is what gives wonderful resonance to that song of praise to the crucified and risen Christ in the book of Revelation, sung by the four living creatures who represent all creation and the 24 elders who represent the whole people of God. What did they sing? They sang out to the Lord Jesus Christ, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God. And they shall reign, where? On the earth. Ecological action then, now, in the present, is both a creational responsibility from the Bible's beginning and also an eschatological sign of the Bible's ending and new beginning. Christian ecological action points towards and anticipates the restoration of our proper status and function in creation. It is to behave as we were originally created to and as we shall one day be fully redeemed for. The earth is waiting with eager longing, says Paul, for the revealing of its appointed kings and priests, redeemed humanity, glorifying God in the temple of his renewed creation under the lordship of of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chris. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but there were times when the non-existent hairs on my head were tingling uh, during that. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, my name's Dave Bookless. I'm Director of Theology for Arosha International. Um, before our second speaker, we're going to have a short time, just five or ten minutes, uh, of questions to Chris on what he's just said. We have two roving mics, uh, so if you have a question, do please put up your hand 
and somebody will try and get a microphone to you uh, wherever you're sat. So we have one right at the back that I can see. Hi, Chris. Thank you very much for that. Yep. Um, I was just thinking about the, the relationship between what you were saying um, about the fullness of the earth being for the praise of God's glory and then Tom Wright's line about tectonic plates doing what tectonic plates do and was wondering where, um, where you might fit into that ideas around well, the reality of death and decay and cruelty in our world. Um, do you see death and decay as something that you would fit into a post-fall world, or would you see that as something that's akin to the tectonic plates and is just part of the natural order of things? So we can look at the beauties and the wonders of creation and see an amazing God through that. The more cynical view could look at a world that's actually predicated on death and pain and come to a very different conclusion. What would be your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, that is a, a very deep question, and, and, and I don't think I've got a final answer to it. Um, I don't personally believe that uh, death and predation only came into existence after the fall, the historical fall of human beings or the rebellion of people against God. Um, all the available evidence seems to point to the uh, existence of that uh, from the beginning of creation itself, that not just of animals but even within vegetation. I mean, vegetation exists by dying and reproducing and so on. Um, so the earth as it is in that sense uh, I believe is part of the goodness of the way God created it. The language of cruelty um, is a moral judgment which we make because we know that if we were to do certain things that we see animals doing, it would be cruel for us to do them. Whether that's a moral judgment we make on the way uh, predation goes right through the, the food chain, as it were, from, from bottom to top and through the vegetation right up to, to predators. Uh, it, I'm not sure that we evaluate that on the same moral scale as, as in, in relation to human beings. So it is, it is a problematic area. There may be others here. I know that Sam Berry is here. I know that Dave himself has, has wrestled with this question. We all do. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm not sure that I would personally want to put those things that we don't like or that we look at and say, yuck to, uh, in, in the way uh, nature works, and see all that as, in some sense, post-fall, uh, I'm not sure that I want to subscribe to that view. But I do believe that the ultimate v um, destiny of creation uh, is to move to a world in which, uh, in God's uh, recreative power, uh, that those things will no longer be part of creation, even though creation will be, a, in some sense, a continuity with what we are now, but that the mortality and the corruptibility and the decay element, which is part of our life as well as creation's life, will no longer be reality in the new creation. Thank you, Chris. I won't try and respond on that, but do carry on the discussion later if you want to. Any other, any other questions just at this point? Right at the front. Give good exercise here to Jeremy with the mic. Hello, Chris. Um, you were saying um, about the dualism that we've created between spirit and matter, and I wonder if you could just say a bit more about that. I was wondering, in the original languages, Hebrew, Greek, um, as my understanding is very limited of it, but I think that the words were sort of the words for breath and wind. Mm -hmm. Is it really the case that spirit was just, uh, they, were, they were completely integrated, the idea of spirit, creation, matter, or was there, was there a sort of separation in the Bible? Do you, um, how, how do you see that? It, it's, it's a little bit of both and, because there's no doubt that there's an integration in, in human life between those elements which are... Uh, given words like ruach and neshama, which speaks of, of life, spirit, breath, um, and uh, are there because God created them and, and put them there, but they're also shared by animals. Animals have breath of life as well. And on the other hand, uh, ruach as applied to God, who is clearly not simply immanent within creation in a pantheistic sense. God is God is above and beyond creation, so he's not simply contained within creation. Um, so there is, in that sense, yes, a God word and a God-related reality which is m more than simply physical. God is not a body. He is not himself matter or physical. But he has cr created a creation which 
in which all that he made, matter and the spiritual, all of those realms are integrated and are all good. So that the, the, the dualism or the, 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 the separation of physical from spiritual in a way which wants to say only the spiritual is good and eternal and the physical is destined for eventually just being zapped and left behind, that I think is, is where I would object and say that is not the biblical view. Because and I think the resurrection of Jesus is in a sense the, the proof of that that he, he did not just live on as a spirit uh, in people's hearts or in any spiritual sense, that God raised him from the dead. And he was as physical, not just as physical as we are, but more physical than we are. He, he had body and he had physical reality. And Paul says that is the model for, for the future for us and for the creation itself. Uh, in Romans 8, Paul links the resurrection very clearly to the creation, that the future of creation is a resurrection future. Uh, the continuity and discontinuity and newness, but it will be this creation that will be renewed. Thank you. Now, I'm going to move on at this point. We will have time for some more questions later after we've heard from David as well, and we'll get Chris